All right, I think we're getting close. We're two or three after. Um, so I will at least begin a formal introduction. If I don't know you, my name is Ryan Anderson. I have the privilege of leading the global research and insights team at Miller Knoll. So that's a group of about 30 of us globally that are involved in research or involved in sharing our insights. If you're normally used to seeing Mark Ketchlove or Birdie, both are valued members of our insights team. We also have workplace strategists, application designers. Basically, our team exists to go learn and to provide practical support to organizations that want to improve their places of work or healthcare environments, higher education environments, et cetera. Uh, one of the things that we love to do from a research standpoint is to partner. I, you know, I'm biased because I get a chance to lead the team, but we decided a long time ago that we'd love to be smartest on every topic, but what we could do to, to improve that is to have the smartest friends in the world. And that includes you all who are participating today, as well as the speakers that we're bringing in. Um, and I'm really, really excited for this special episode. We kind of scheduled an extra episode to be able to share with you the results of this particular research project led by Dr. Nigel Osland and um, Ian Ellison, as well as Gary Raw. I'll introduce these gents in a minute. But in the way of quick background, um, I think it was, I don't remember how many months ago it was now, Nigel, but a while back, Nigel and, and Gary and Ian came and said, hey, we've got an idea for a research project, and uh, we were thrilled to be able to support it and partner. Admittedly, they did the hard work, but the results have been fascinating, um, and we're excited to be able to dive into it with you today. All right, welcome to the others that have joined. Thank you for putting your locations in. Well, let me give you a little bit of background on the two gentlemen that we're hearing from today. If you don't know Dr. Nigel Osland, uh, you're in for a treat. Nigel's a workplace strategist, change manager, environmental psychologist, researcher and speakers with uh, 11 years of research and 25 years of consulting experience. You might know his organization, Workplace Unlimited, where he dives into a wide variety of topics. I did write some of them down, like psychoacoustics, that's a new one, uh, psychological needs, remote working, collaboration, biophilic design, and a host of others. And you also probably know Nigel as the program advisor for the Workplace Trends series of international conferences. Nigel, thankful for your partnership, glad you're here today. Thank you. Joining Nigel is Ian Ellison, uh, who is also a well-recognized figure in the UK and beyond for many years now, 25 years, uh, has taught at Sheffield Hallam University, co-founded Three Edges Workplace, currently hosts the Workplace Geeks podcast, shout out to a fellow podcaster, and is co-founder of the AI-powered Workplace Experience Insights platform, audium.io, which you will hear more about today. Okay. Guys, super thankful for you, for your work with us, and uh, I will turn it over to you to begin to unpack the results of this most recent project for us. The one thing I will say beforehand is we welcome questions. We want questions. Put the questions in the chat uh, for anybody that has them. And if you want to adjust your view of content or people, you can do that with the layout button on the upper right or by just kind of dragging the line between the faces and the content so that you can see what you need to see effectively. All right, gents, over to you. Many thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, thanks for setting this up and for partnering on this. Uh, yeah, interesting is probably an understatement in terms of the, the project and the results that we've got back. And as you said, it all started uh, quite a few months ago now with all that press coverage, lots of press coverage about the return to the office and should people return or not return and how many days should they return. And we're seeing that some companies are saying you've got to be in five days a week and therefore we need the best space to maybe attract people back or why aren't they coming back and then there's other companies who are saying look people are only going to come in a couple of days a week now so why don't we reduce our office space offering and it, it, whichever way you look at it we still know that utilization is is pretty low and, and i've heard reports where oh, utilization is back to pre-covid days which was only 50 percent anyway so we've still got offices or half the offices sitting empty for half the time and then uh, actually a lot of recent figures have shown that utilization is still down at 30 percent which which i just don't think is sustainable I, I, it's just not the way forward the way we should be thinking about workplace so what i the way i came from it with with gary Raw, my, my colleague on this is we're saying if we're going to have offices we need to make them better utilized we therefore need to attract people back if that's what we want we want offices and to be honest for someone in the workplace industry 
I want people to want to come back to offices and I want us to use offices. That's how I make my, my living. So how do we attract people back? And, and both Gary and I, we, we're both chartered psychologists, environmental psychologists, and we just wanted to get under the skin of what it was that why pe some people were coming back and others weren't and how could we maybe entice them back to the office. So we did an online, created an online survey. We actually got 649 responses in total, and we, and we got those responses through email. Uh, we worked with Workplace Trends. Maggie, she sent, sent the, uh, the invite to participate out to her, her uh, group of 10,000 or so people and her email list. And also we did it organically, grew it through social media. And we got 649 responses, as I said, but we then filtered it. We, we wanted people to respond who had experience of both working in an office, a corporate office, not just a, their own office, their own freelance or independent consulting office, and also people who've been working from home for some time as well. So when we filtered those people out, we, we ended up with 490. Shame it wasn't 500, we almost got there, but we needed to get on with our analysis. And again, from this uh, pie chart here, you can see that almost a half of our respondents were from the UK. We were specifically targeting UK and, and uh, Europe, and uh, almost another half came from the rest of Europe and, and uh, North America. <clears throat> so one of the questions we asked was a very broad question. On this scale of 0 to 100, do you prefer to work at home? Uh, you know, is a home a better place to work, or is your office a better place to work? And you can see we've got a nice distribution with around, again, just over half the people saying, actually, do you know what? I, I think home is now a better place for me to work. A third of people, so quite a bit less, said, actually, no, I still prefer to work in the office. And then we had uh, a few people sitting on the fence. There. So that in itself says something to me. How have we got to this situation where people are now saying, do you know what? I prefer to work from home rather than the office. And that's what we wanted to explore. And the way we explored it is we came up with 51, yes, 51 core questions. We actually started off with about 150 questions we wanted to ask people. That's just not feasible when you do an online survey. So we, we kind of boiled it down, condensed it down to 51 core questions, which we split into four sections, as you can see here. And the first section asked them about preference in terms or preference for the office or home in terms of activities. So what they're doing, quiet work, collaboration work, meetings, uh, focus work, online stuff and so on. Then we had a, a group of questions relating to the facilities, the workspace, the layout of the space, the environmental conditions. We then drove down to a section which was about benefits, mostly personal benefits, what people get from working from home and working in the office. And then the final set of questions was about a sense of purpose. So that included things like connectivity, sense of belonging, and, and so on. And we actually asked the questions in a random order. Um, we, we kept it to the four sections, but when we asked people the questions within each section, it was randomized, just so we didn't get too much bias in terms of uh, priority of questions or what we thought was priority. Now, the way they answered those questions was actually on a five point scale. So you can see here just for the work activities question, it's, you know, uh, for each of the following work activities, do you personally find it better supported in the office or at home? And then we had a whole list of things. So socializing with colleagues, focused work, concentrated work, having meetings, teamwork, collaboration. And then we asked them to answer it on this five point scale. But what we did then, just for ease, just to make life easier for everyone, is we actually just grouped it into a preference, if you like, for the home, uh, the percentage of people who rated a preference for the office, and then the people between who uh, hadn't quite made up their mind or couldn't decide whether the office or the home was better for different activities and so on. So I'm going to present the next few slides as those percentages on those three, three groups, if you like. <clears throat> So back to work activities. So you can see here our, our list of 14 or so work activities. And what we've done is just color code it. So the percentage of people who say that the office is better in dark blue, the home is better in light blue, or 
uh, that, you know, there's, there's no obvious, presenter people said there's no obvious benefit between the home and, and the office. And what you can immediately see is that in terms of the home and, the, and, and more support of the home or better working at the home, you can see that that relates to working on confidential information, so confidential and personal phone calls, for example. It's about concentration uh, and focus, and also it better supports productivity. And by productivity, I mean, that's a broad, a broad uh, description, but the productivity in this case was, I think people were interpreting it as, as output deliverables that, that needed to get out rather than productivity and say long-term productivity, such as um, innovation and, and creativity. And then you can see that obviously below that, in terms of the office, um, people um, were seeing that it was better suited for things like what we might expect, teamwork, collaboration, socialising, sharing knowledge. Um, so, so kind of uh, about organisational development. And then uh, we also saw that uh, people uh, prefer the office for things like creativity, obviously team meetings and client meetings and, and so on. So um, I don't think this is new. I, th I think we've heard this before. We, we, we're constantly hearing that people say, yeah, if I want to focus and concentrate and work without distraction, I'm going to do that at home. And when I come into the office, that's more about uh, collaboration, team meetings, networking and socialising. Let's not forget socialising. Really important. If we socialise with colleagues, we build trust and that leads to better collaboration, better teamwork. So. Um, but say this is nothing new. But but what what I will say is it's nothing new. But it keeps coming up, and we need to recognise at least that offices aren't just for teamwork and collaboration and creativity. Offices also need to hof, offer space and and the and, and the facilities for confidential work, focus concentration as well and i think we sometimes forget that when we design offices i think we like to focus on the the nice stuff the kind of oh let's create some funky creative environments and let's get people together and networking and socializing but no a lot of people still need to go to the office for focus and concentration so then in terms of the facilities and environmental conditions again similar things uh, light blue represents the percentage of people who are saying they think the office better supports these things, sorry, the home better supports these things, and the dark blue, uh, the office. Now, what you immediately can see is that actually when it comes to environmental conditions, so temperature, lighting, noise, desk layout, space, and so on, what we're definitely seeing is that people are saying it's better supported in their home. And in contrast, Probably the only one that really sticks out in terms of what's better supported in the office is the choice, choice of meetings, and that's for meetings with clients and meetings with colleagues. But again, did, do, do we know this? Maybe we have known this, but what grates here with me, for me is that the fact that we're providing, supposedly providing these fantastic offices that offer better facilities, better environmental control, better conditions, better furniture, better, better ergonomics and so on. And yet what I'm, we're clearly seeing here from our sample is people saying, actually, no, I get more, I get that better provided in my home. So I think we've got a lot of work to do if we want to entice people back to the office, because right now they're, they're voting with their feet and they're not coming in. And it's because I believe these, let's call them hygiene factors, these basic factors that we need to get right are better supported at home than in the office. And that's not good for our industry. So then we asked about benefits. And uh, as I said, it's mostly about personal benefits. Not surprising. I've seen, I think we've seen this in plenty of other surveys, but not surprising that in terms of personal benefits, particularly reduced travel time and travel cost, work-life balance, arranging childcare, managing health risks, all those things, we find that yeah, better supported working from home rather than in the office. Where the office does uh, come out a little bit higher in terms of support is things like loneliness, reducing workplace loneliness. Loneliness is a killer. It's a big factor. If you believe the reports that are out there in the UK, for example, they're saying it's £2.5 billion a year employers 
employers lose to loneliness and, and it's a knock-on effect of absenteeism taking care for people with loneliness hospital visits and so on so I'm, I'm not i'm not convinced the number is actually that big but it's still a big factor so what the office is good at is bringing people together helping reduce loneliness and also offering routine so people get can separate out work from 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 home life um, but the routine of coming into a space knowing where everything is knowing where their colleagues are knowing where the tech is the meeting spaces and so on and that delineation that kind of that's work that's home so that that's what the office is good at but boy look at all the personal benefits that it's not so good at and the question is as i said are people voting with their feet if Anyone who works in and around London these days, it's £35, 30 or so pounds to get in and out of London. And then you've got your sandwiches at Pret, £10, your coffees, another £5. It all adds up, certainly for people who are maybe not high income earners. Why, why would they spend an extra £50, £60 pounds a day to go to an office which they don't believe supports them as well as their home? And then we asked about this kind of sense of purpose. So this is the things like connectivity, being part of the culture, a sense of belonging, um, uh, sharing knowledge. And you can see that, okay, this time around, yeah, definitely the, the office seems to be better at supporting a sense of purpose. Where the only thing where the home came out a little bit stronger was for environmental conditions, environmental factors. And we think that's because of a perception of reduced travel and therefore maybe reduced impact on the environment. But we've still got to unravel that a little bit. But yeah, um, what you can see though is people definitely think that it's uh, the office is good for uh, embedding in the culture, for career progression, reducing that fear of missing out, all of those kind of things. But is that good enough to get people back to the office? After each section, we asked them what the two most important factors were. And then at the end, we asked them of the eight important factors you've chosen, uh, now pick another three of the most important overall or uh, in, in terms of attracting you back to the office. And again, not surprisingly, I don't think here we can see that the, the three main or four, four main factors to the office is teamwork, coming back into work with your colleagues, it's socialising with your colleagues, it's connecting to your colleagues and the business and your clients. And it's also offering that little bit of delineation I mentioned between home and work life. And then what's discouraging you from coming to the office? Well, uh, again, no surprises here, but travel cost and time is the big one. And then I think what's more interesting is this, you know, we can't concentrate in the office and there's too much noise in the office and I'm getting disruptions and distractions. I can't do my work in the office. Um, and then the confidentiality one as well. There's no spaces for those confidential, either client or personal calls. So we've got a lot of work to do here to uh, uh, bring people back to the office. And, and I, I'll come on to some of the solutions in, in a minute, but if we're going to resolve it, we've got to resolve the hygiene factors, but then also consider things like travel uh, as well. So that those were the results for the whole sample, the, the, the uh, 490 people that we, we, we filtered. Um, what I'm going to do now is share with you the results from different subgroups within that sample. So I've presented already the slides in this format, the three categories, the percentage of preference for home, office or indifferent. And what I'm going to do now is just convert that to a line, which is the percentage of people preferring the office. So it's just going to be presented as a line, but I'm going to break it down now by different groups. So this is the first one, homeworking. And um, I kind of expected this result, but not, not so great. I mean, I'm, I'm basically plotting you. I'm showing you the results that were statistically significant and also the top 20 largest differences. So the, the charts do vary a little bit from one to the other, but I wanted to show you where we're seeing differences. Now, what you can see straight away from this, the purple line, people who've been working from home for less than a year are more likely or more of them would prefer working in the office. And we think that's a mixture of the tech and the kit they've got at home. During COVID, people were given grants to buy more, uh, so some people were given grants by their employers to buy more technology, to buy better ergonomic furniture, to sort out a, a kind of home office, if you like. And also 
so, so that may be a factor. And we think the other factor is, of course, if you've just if you've joined a company recently, um, it may be that you're not working uh, from, from home or, or you, uh, so, so much because you've just started work. You, you've not really uh, worked from home for long periods of time. But massive differences here uh, for, between the people uh, who've not been working from home for long and their colleagues who've been working for longer. And I've just highlighted here some of the largest differences. So uh, technology and ergonomics. Yeah, doesn't surprise me. Storage as well, but it's also things like um, career goals and um, uh, uh, things like making decisions and, of course, uh, team meetings are quite functional. So, working from home, uh, um, if, if, if le less time working from home, the more likely they are to want to work in the office. Now we ask them about, okay, if you're working from home, where are you working? And again, what you can see is that the people who are working from a kitchen table, because not everyone can afford to have a private office at home or a cabin in the garden like myself. Um, but those people who are working from the kitchen table uh, in particular are the ones that are more likely to say they want to uh, work, in, work in the office. And you can see, in contrast, the people who have a private office at home uh, are quite happy to stay working from home. And um, some of the big differences here, again, um, some of the functional stuff like ergonomics and layout, but also sense of purpose, reward, is where we've seen some of the larger differences. I found this slide quite interesting, or this, this analysis. We asked people what kind of organisation they worked for. Now, bear in mind, we, we filtered out the people, the independents, uh, the small, uh, sorry, with the independents and the people who are freelancing and so on. And uh, some of them did complain that they'd been filtered out because they said, we've got a lot to, to, to offer and tell you about how, the difference between working from home and in the office. But we wanted people who had experience working with a, with a larger organisation in, in their offices at, compared to their working from home. So what we found here is that the small, medium enterprises in particular, the people who work for small medium enterprises, they were the ones that are more likely or prefer working in the office. And we think that's because um, the, the small and medium enterprise companies tend to be entre more entrepreneurial. They may have a more motivational culture. They may have stronger leadership. They, uh, they, 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 they may be startup companies, so they're on a deadline. They just want to get things done. They're bringing people together. They're all working together and so on. In contrast, we can see the public sector and uh, quite often the education sector are the ones that are actually saying, do you know what, quite happy to continue working from home. Uh, and I kind of get that if you're working in the public sector and maybe you've got a processing type job and you can deliver that as easy from home as in the office, um, then then that makes sense. And, 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 and if you bring in the cost of travel and so on to that equation, then you can see why some people are saying actually I'm going to work from home. Uh, and I've just highlighted some of those, uh, the, the, the key factors there, but you can see a lot of it is around that sense of belonging, sense of purpose, sharing knowledge, culture, leadership, all of that good stuff. Okay, next slide is the team base. So we asked people, did they work with a mostly office based team? Or do they work alone or do they work with a distributed team? So again, interesting result here. Um, maybe the more obvious one is, yeah, if, if you're an office-based team, then you're more likely to want to come and work in the office. That makes perfect sense. But I also think the, the fact that people are working alone, uh, there's some big differences there. And when it comes to people working alone, they, they, they're kind of quite happy to, to still carry on working, uh, even when it comes to things like re reward and so on. But when it comes to teamwork and uh, managing their team and connection and so on, you can see that the, 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 the line shifts to uh, almost everyone, all, all groups having a higher preference for, for working in, in, in the office. But I think it is interesting that um, loan workers uh, and if you look at distributed workers in green down the bottom, the distributed workers um, falling behind in terms of teamwork and management and connection compared to those who are office based. This is probably the most controversial slide in the, in the deck. Uh, we asked people whether they had an assigned and allocated desk 
or an unallocated desk, i.e. where they pop desking, desk sharing, and so on. Now, th there are differences. There's statistically significant differences. The difference is about 10%. So, so there's some differences, but they're not as massive uh, as some of the other uh, differences that we've seen in the other slides. But you can see it almost straight across the board in terms of the, 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 the top 20 um, people with assigned offices uh, prefer the office, think that the office is better supporting them across um, the sense of purpose factors and, and some of the others. So, um, as I said, this is kind of controversial because if people are working from home two or three days a week, then one way of uh, helping in terms of sustainability both is, is to maybe introduce or implement hot desking and then reduce the space. Uh, that means that we can reduce the heating, the maintenance, the servicing of the space and so on. So um, but this slide suggests that actually, if if you don't give people a, a desk, then they're less likely to come back into the office anyway. So it's, this is a real catch-22 scenario. And um, I think it's one for a lot of careful management required. Let's just say that for now. And um, then we looked at uh, what kind of space do people occupy when they're in the office. And uh, again, you can see that private office, um, people have got a private office, it's certainly better for things like concentration and productivity. Um, whereas people who work elsewhere, and by that the hot desk is the people who tend to be, uh, be more, more, more mobile, uh, you, you can see that, um, that for them there's, there's issues more around um, you know, in terms of sense of belonging and sense of purpose, there's more of a sway to coming in the office for that, but it's still below uh, the other groups. This is probably the other, the other um, more controversial slide. Uh, there's a lot of research out about generation differences, age differences, and so on. We found no statistically significant differences for age generation, and um, in about the last four or five surveys I've been involved in research wise, not found any major generational differences. But what we do find is differences when it comes to family circumstances. So you can see here that there's a clear difference between single parents with dependents, particularly children, and other groups of people. So we found that the single parents, um, a higher proportion of them are more likely to want to come back to the office or think it, believe, you know, it, it, it better supports a whole raft of things in particular career development, uh, sense of belonging, and, 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 and being given some good leadership. But we, we also think it's, it's about um, escape, it's about having a break. If, for, for single parents who are looking after dependents, um, the office may be a, a chance to get away from that and, and have a bit of a break. And we did this time. Then, uh, personality, I'm still going in. Um, but personality, we've got introverts, uh, ambiverts, extroverts. And again, what we find is a clear difference between the extroverts and the introverts, extroverts more likely to come back to the office or we'll think the office better supports supports them in terms of creativity, in terms of leadership, uh, in terms of teamwork and so on. Introverts much happier to continue working from home. And then the final slide from me, I've got some more after Ian, is around the work people working in our industry, work workspace specialists. And we found some small differences. Uh, not as big as we might expect, so that's good. It means that we in the workplace industry, we're, we're actually uh, on the same wavelength as, as, as the occupants. But we do see a few little differences around sense of belonging, sense of purpose. Uh, and that doesn't surprise me. I, I, th I think that in the industry, we like to think that the office offers, offers all of this good stuff. Right, there we go. I'm going to hand over to Ian. He's going to tell you a little bit more about some of the qualitative stuff. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Nigel. I'm sorry I jumped in quick there. I forgot you put the two new slides on at the front. So what I just need to make sure I can do is make this thing work. So hello, folks. Um, so if Nigel was the news presenter, I'm a bit like the weather report now. So I've got a little bit of time to tell you. So what happened with this survey was very generously, Nigel and Gary, I've just lost the presentation. Oh, yes, I have notes working. So 
we were able to ask one free text question as well as all the statistical data that Nigel was collecting. So what we were able to ask was, tell us more about your preference to work from home versus in the office, what's important to you and why, and really encourage people to provide some specific examples where possible. And so of those 490 that Nigel filtered, we got 298 responses to that. So if we quickly look into this, what's going on with this Free text. Well, the challenge of free text is it's huge. Nearly 26,000 words, which is about 52 pages of text. It takes ages to read, but the benefit of it is that you really get into this data. So the tool we used to explore this, as um, Ryan mentioned at the beginning, was our new tool. So essentially what Audium does is it takes these big, rich viewpoints, it snips them up into different talking points, it runs them through an AI engine, which has been essentially trained to think like a workplace consultant, and it looks at sentiment, it looks at different workplace themes and sub-themes, which we've sort of built as our framework, it looks at the relationships between those themes, it looks at discussion topics, and it also sort of, sort of ground up topics that are emerging from within the data, and it looks at suggestions, linguistic suggestions. So when we applied that, and I'm moving at one heck of a pace, when we looked in the dashboard and applied that, we got 1,252 talking points out of those two, 298 viewpoints. And it's quite interesting because the last slide that Nigel finished it on was between working professionals and every, sorry, workplace professionals and everybody else. Not quite an even split, 62 workplace professionals were versus 38 percent everybody else but actually waxing lyrical to a sort of a similar average 89 words per viewpoint versus 82 words per viewpoint and when we look at it you can sort of see it's a really mixed bag in terms of what people are talking about and also the sentiment now when we then split that out and have a look in terms of workplace professionals versus everybody else actually everything looks quite similar so and this i tried to cut this data in all sorts of different ways gender different uh, roles different tenure all the different filters kind of showed a very similar pattern so either this data set is, is quite small and we're not starting to see lots of sort of diversity in the comments or everybody's talking about similar stuff and i kind of feel like everybody's talking about similar stuff or when you look at the overall data set you get a real representation of just how broad this discussion has now been about hybrid work in a post-pandemic age. So if we turn to Nigel and Gary's initial, their original reasons for doing this this, this, um, this study, how do we attract people back? What are the concerns and what are the working from home benefits? If we just sort of bring this to life for you, what you find around attracting back is this real considered awareness of the the pros and cons of the office essentially professional work settings and you see some of it and you expect some of it collegiate and social elements that nigel spotted in the statistics stimulation and creativity a variety of encounters learning and mentoring from different people um, and, and and needing a variety of quality settings but then there's this sort of really rich layer that kind of shows that i love this quote below i have a more complete life when the office is included in my workscape as much as working from home, but also a challenge, which is it doesn't matter how good the design is, it's got to get, re it's got to work very, very hard to get past those hygiene factors of things like um, the commute and the cost of the commute. What about the concerns? Well, there's a real interesting point here, which is we often frame this whole thing re in really binary ways. What's good for one isn't, you know, isn't good for another. Actually, there's all sorts of different preferences in here around introversion, around extroversion, around your role. There's so much diversity it's really hard to say it should be this or it should be that. So isolate, you know, why turn up to an office, which is supposed to be about collaboration if it's completely empty? Why turn up to an office that's poorly designed? Why turn up to an office when I've got a better chair at home or vice versa, some people coming in because they've got better ergonomics on in the workplace? Definitely this thing around segmenting home and work life for some people. Presenteeism, still alive and kicking, this need to be seen for a career progression, but also being surrounded people almost as a motivational factor. And in some of the conversation and so in some of the comments, this real focus on, you know, we have this conundrum that Nigel mentioned around the planet 
and yet we are still insisting on you know an office coming into the office and it being half full and stuff like that i think around working from home benefits the, the big headline is the amount of reflection and consideration of all sorts of things like neurodiversity and well-being and physical health and introversion versus extroversion preferences when now that we've experienced both and fascinating how open people are to talk about these things to talking about these things um now that they've kind of experienced it and we're in a sort of an age where it's okay to do that so huge rich diversity so i i think what i'm going to do here is i'm just going to pick out the headlines really quickly and then pass back to nigel but what you see here is a real reflection of more complicated lives it's not just about one office or working from home and, and, and as simple as that, there's all sorts of stuff. What doesn't get represented is diverse teams in this home office debate. So this whole thing about, you know, should it be home or office? Well, what if you have a global team? Why on earth would you go to a local office? What benefit does that bring you? There's all sorts of discussions around autonomy and trust and choice and how that is so valued, but still you need a critical mass of colleagues for it to work. And I'm just going to point to this bottom one personally because I like it's cheeky and I've got a hunch that actually the reason that lots of people love working from home is because it's just easier and more comfortable to work from home. But I rather like the bottom quote because it's kind of about the most honest thing I've seen in a long time about the working from home debate. So, <laughs> Nigel, over to you. Thanks, Ian. Um, I need to get just get back control um, of the deal. So, um, yeah, insightful stuff there, especially that last comment. Um, and uh, it, what, what I like about what you've done there is you, 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 you've kind of verified what we found with the quantitative data, but then you've taken it one step further. Now, right at the start, um, I, I mentioned, oh, it's, hold on, um, something's gone wrong here, and I'm, I haven't got control. So, uh, can I can give them back control, please. Yes, I will. Apologies. Have you got it now? Yeah, thanks. Okay. So, um, so right at the start, I said we, we, we split the questions into four main uh, core areas, core groups. Uh, and, and we kind of did that based on how we thought the questions would be better grouped. But we also ran what's called a factor analysis or principal component analysis, to be precise. And what the principal components analysis does, it looks at all the responses that individuals have made, and then it looks for the intercorrelations. So it's trying to work out what how people are rating things similarly. And then, and then it creates its own groups. Um, and unusual. I mean, normally when you run a, an analysis like this, you, you might get five or six different distinct groups. We actually got 12 uh, distinct groups of questions, groupings of questions, of which I would say eight uh, are really clear and make make good sense. And then there's a, there's a few others. But you can see you can see the way it's it's uh, that, that you don't need to read the chart on the right. But I, I just put that in there to show you how it grouped the uh, 51 uh, individual questions. Um, so, for example, if we look at org organizational belonging, you can see how it's grouped the distant, different clusters of the or the different types of questions that we asked. And he said these questions belong together. People are ans answering them similarly. Similarly, uh, same with work interactions. This group of questions are all pretty much about work interaction. And um, the, the reason I've, I've, I've included this is because we we thought we had four distinct categories but actually there's probably eight ways that people our respondents in particular uh eight ways that they think about the workplace and what's important to them so if you're trying to attract people back to the workplace think about how you create this sense of organizational belonging think about how you can enhance work interactions think about how you can provide spaces for concentration how you can provide them with control of their environment and their spaces and so on how they can manage their workload and how you can help them uh, manage their personal time and so it's something to think about if you're doing a change management program the the other thing we did right at the start i, I we asked that general uh, overall overarching question where do you where do you prefer to be all things considered do you prefer to work in the office or in the home and what we did is we then used our 51 questions to see which ones were best at predicting that overall response 
and surprisingly what came out is desk layout and density so people's uh, ratings of their desk layout and density was the the, the biggest uh, factor that predicted their overall uh, preference for the office and the home and weirdly it, it didn't kind of come up in any of the early analysis I've showed you as a, as a big deal but when it comes down to it what is the single most important thing to predict whether people are going to come in the office or home and desk layout and density comes out and it doesn't surprise me because I think the density in particular, it's a kind of all encompassing variable, if you like, because the, the density captures the amount of space that people have. We know that density can affect environmental controls conditions. If, if, if the space is over dense, then um, sometimes the, the, the building can't support the, uh, the, the, the kind of indoor air quality or the temperature. We know that density affects things like noise. Um, if you're sitting on top of people, you're more likely to get distracted by them. You're more likely to have more interactions. If, if your space is just full of highly packed dense, then you're probably going to have less breakout space, less informal meeting areas, less of the nice facilities. So it, it does seem to me that uh, desk layout and density is, is, is what Adrian Lehman used to call a killer variable. You know, we've got to get that right, because if we're creating highly dense environments, uh, people aren't going to want to come back. You can also see there that concentration. I need space to focus and concentrate is important. And also goals in terms of my uh, career objectives, career goals, the team goals. Um, that is also a factor uh, that is important for whether people come in the office or not. So just to sum up our, our results, uh, and then we can have a few questions. Um, so it's not all about collaboration. We definitely need to sort this thing. It's been going on for years. We need to sort it out how we can provide office environments that reduce noise, offer privacy, acoustic and visual privacy, but certainly acoustic privacy, and they also allow people to focus and concentrate. Basically, we, we've got to help reduce dis distractions that's partly about behaviours, but it's certainly also about design. And I think density definitely comes into that. As I said, we know that offices are good for collaboration and socialising. We seem to be, uh, that's what people come into the office for. So we just need to build on that and make sure that we are providing those spaces as well. But balance it with other areas, focus and concentration. Now, when it comes to personal benefits, how do we entice people back if, they, if they're spending more time and cost on travel. Well, we might then start to look at things about how we can maybe subsidise travel, or offer people um, uh, uh, loans so that they can they can uh, distribute their travel a little travel costs a little bit and so on. So that's more of a management issue, but it's still important if we want to get people back in the office. We've also heard uh, more often than not now this idea that the office needs to be a, a, a destination. So create events, create social events, work events, training, uh, meeting new recruits, all those things, uh, <laughs> birthday parties, coffee mornings, yoga sessions, whatever it is, we need to create these kind of events so that people think it's worth their while going into the office. They can do something that they're not doing at home and also emphasize the sense of purpose. It is about career development. It is about to building community. It is about a sense of belonging. Leadership, obviously important. We saw that those small, medium enterprises, people who work for them are more likely to want to come back to the office. So again, how do we recreate that motivational culture, that strong leadership that makes people want to come back into the office? And then as Ian just uh, mentioned as well, it's not one size fits all. So I know that's a bit of a cliche, but when we, when we start to split our our data, our responses by different groups of people, we find different responses. We need to consider the individuals, their, their differences and their needs. And finally, I'm just going to leave it hanging. There's the whole issue of the assigned desks. Uh, do we assign desks or don't we assign desks? I think this is about really understanding your company and understanding your people and then making the right decision. And that's all I wanted to say from myself and from Ian. Uh, I think we have a bit of time for questions, Ryan. Fantastic job, gentlemen. Yeah, I've been writing down questions as we go. I hope that I don't miss any, but I'm going to start uh, with a couple of ones that I think are fairly basic. Remind us when the survey was done. <laughs> um, it was post-COVID. It was um, 
it was a few months ago, wasn't it? Well, I think it was it, July, it was August summer, time just frame, before right? summer, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, I think, right in the midst of, of uh, summer. Great. Um, we saw the uh, results broken down by a variety of factor. A couple of the questions related to gender, uh, seniority. I don't know that that was particularly in the breakdowns. Um, remind we, us if, if we cut it by that. We, we had so many questions to ask. We didn't ask about tenure or seniority weirdly um so we did have this thing as i said we we didn't find any 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 uh age or, or uh, millennial generational differences didn't find any of those i think in terms of seniority it, it's kind of confounded with the fact that more senior people have probably got uh, more freedom to work at home they may even have private offices so so there's a whole range of confounding factors there that we couldn't quite unravel yeah. But, um, uh, but but I, I wouldn't say I would say it's a factor. But, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, question from our friend Emily. Uh, the question about personality types. How were those yeah. determined? What was that based on? Okay, so <laughs> we had so many questions. We had to take a few shortcuts. I'm being honest here. And normally, when I ask about uh, when I profile people's personality, we we, we I use something called Ocean, uh, which is uh, we we measure them on openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And then sometimes I just pick out the the one for extroversion, introversion. What we did for this, we just asked a single question. Do you believe you're introverted or extroverted? So it was it was a it was a, a proxy measure, I would say, but, well, but, it, but it still showed some interesting results. Yeah, what well, actually, in some ways, I like that you're asking how people perceive themselves, and then correlating it with the answer because to me that may be more revealing than looking after some other method of of categorizing. Yeah, so um, um, it, it's interesting because there's there's this thing about the ideal extrovert. So. Um, how do people perceive themselves? I mean, psychologists might measure it differently, but I think how people perceive themselves, introvert, extrovert, like you say, is important. And what's interesting, you get this thing called the ideal extrovert, where people who might be introverted mimic extroverted, extrovert behavior, because it, it's, it's a good thing to be seen to be extrovert in some organizations. So actually the perception of where they th uh, think they fit, I, I think works quite well. Yeah, we've gotten a few questions about desk sizing, uh, square meter allocation, et cetera. I, I can't help but be a little editorial here and offer a few thoughts myself. We get a lot of organizations coming to us, of course, hundreds every year. And it used to be that desk sharing was too many people, not enough desks, let's share desks. These days with some countries, particularly Canada, US, UK, having lower occupancy rates, it's almost like the mentality has flipped. There's not enough people, there's too many desks, we'll share desks. It's almost like a carrot and stick thing. If you don't come in, you don't get an assigned desk. My personal takeaway from what you've shared is that that is a dangerous strategy. <laughs> that having extra space and not giving that space to the employees, but somehow taking away something may only potentially accelerate the decrease in demand for office as opposed to to improve upon it. I'm curious whether or not, as I said, that's my interpretation of some of what you've seen. What are your thoughts, gents? It, it, it's so complicated, isn't it? Because I said, it, I, I, I've, I've been promoting the guys, if we want to be sustainable and the, and the offices are off empty, we need to do something about that. So we need to implement uh, desk sharing and, and get the utilization rates back up and release some space. But I would never say release all of the space that you're not using because what I found, and, and, and there's evidence for it over the last 20 years, certainly in the UK, we've just densified the offices so much. What I'm saying is this is a great opportunity for us to reduce the density, provide really comfortable, enticing spaces that people want to come to. And that's not just about reducing the, the, the desk layout and density itself. That's about providing the spaces, the facilities that they need, you know, the, these other spaces that might attract people into the office more. So that that's my take on it. But, but you have to do a load of work to work out what's right for your business, first of all, because I'm, I'm actually working with two clients and they want their people back in five days a week. It's not an edict, but it's certainly a strong leadership and cultural persuasion, I would say. Yeah, actually, we just did a separate study 
uh, surveying 5,000 people in nine countries, found that 49% of them said that their their employer is full time in the office. Definitely lower in UK, Canada, US, Australia, but it's still a major factor around the world. Um, I also have to forgive me. I have to put in a little plug for Miller Knowles podcast. We've been doing quite a few episodes lately on inclusive design, and one of the topics we got into just a couple of weeks ago with the leading architect is being more generous with space is an inclusive strategy. And it's not just for those with mobility limitations, but uh, whether we're talking neurodivergent, sensory issues, a whole host of other things being crammed together. <laughs> I mean, none of us like it, right? Um, but it, it, that extra space can be used to be more inclusive. Yeah, um, I, say, it, it can, I think it's the, the, the killer variable, as I said, and, and, and maybe that's not the right wording, but it does seem to density does seem to be causing so many issues. Um, uh, even cross infection comes into it, uh, things like that. Uh, so just be careful. Sorry to interrupt, Jets. If, if I could offer a slightly different perspective from the qualitative data, we sure. were whistling past the charts at a speed of knots. But when you ask people to comment generally, most of the content of the comments is about people stuff. And within that people stuff is discussion about leadership and management and context and all of those things. So actually, I wonder if that question is in some respects a bit of a red herring you can't necessarily just solve it with space. It is a system which involves people and how they work together. And you're absolutely right, Nigel, around density and poor space is not remotely attractive. That comment about it's a me versus we versus planet thing needs some really honest yeah. adult, adult discussion about give and take and what's going to work for us. And you only get that with good leadership and management. Yeah, I, I think I think it's a good point, Ian. And, and, um, I, and I did like that quote, I have to say. I, I would also say that the um, that that the space issue, the density does link a little bit to that sense of belonging, organize a sense of worth. Yeah, if, if, if people are having space extracted from them, it's like I'm working for a company that's not even given me a decent workplace and it's not even giving me space. Mm -hmm. That's a reflection of leadership. That's a reflection of culture. Maybe, maybe not as direct as, as I'd like it to be, but but I think there is something in that as well. It's like how people manage and operate their space and design it is a reflection of of how much you're valued by the organization. I think I think you're onto something, and and we often say around here that uh, people may be far more interested in being in the office, but have more concerns about office culture. So we shouldn't assume that if people have concerns about being in the office that it's all spatial. And you're right. I do think that it says something to the employees, doesn't it, when they walk into a space and it feels like a very tailorist uniform assembly line of of desks. Oh, guys, I could just sit and riff on this with you as we have for a really long time. And there are several questions that we didn't get to. I apologize, friends. Um, but let me answer the question that we've been asked the most, which is, are we getting a copy of this <laughs> of this deck uh, and the video? So as with all of our insights um, webinars, we will publish a video to YouTube. We will send a follow up email. Um, it has a summary of these slides, and I think all of us are fairly accessible on LinkedIn. So I want to end with just a couple of uh, minutes left. Let me just put in a little bit of a plug. If this is your first time engaging with one of our um, Insight webinars, you can go to millernoll.com, click on the Insights tab. You're going to find other awesome experiences like this, as well as Miller Knowles podcast on uh, the future of work and workplace and a series of articles that we've put out uh, on a variety of topics very recently. But most of all, I want to conclude with thanking both of you, Nigel, Ian and Gary, who's not with us today for your thought partnership, your friendship, for your collaboration on this um, love learning together. And I think you've given us more than uh, a substantial amount of stuff to sink our teeth into. So thank you. Thanks, Ryan. All right, everyone, if you want to say thanks to these gents, feel free to put it in the chat. Apologies for those that maybe we didn't get to your questions, but thank you as always for participating and have a fantastic day.